Um, thank you very much, everyone. Good evening and welcome to this evening's event from the South Asia Center. I'm sorry for the slight delay, but we were trying to bring in all those people who did not have tickets and bring them in um, on time. Uh, there are still seats available, so we will be on the lookout for others who are later than we all are. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to this um, event, a book discussion and a Q&A uh, with Dr. Shashi Tharoor on his new latest book. Um, Dr. Shashi Tharoor is an author and politician currently serving as a Lok Sabha MP representing Trivandrum in India. He's chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on External Affairs and a member of the Standing Committee on Rules. He has previously served as Minister of State for Human Resource Development and Minister of State for External Affairs in the Government of India. Before his political career in India, Shashi worked for almost three decades at the United Nations, where he served as a peacekeeper, a refugee worker, and as Under Secretary General between 2001 and 2007. Shashi is a regular media commentator and an award-winning author of both fiction and non-fiction. He has published three novels and a collection of short stories, alongside his works on Indian history, foreign policy, politics, society, and, of course, sport. The book we are discussing tonight is Inglorious Empire, What the British Did to India, published as An Era of Darkness in India, and this is his 16th book. Shashi was educated in India and the United States, completing a PhD in 1978 at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He's recipient of several honorary degrees, as well as awards that include the Commonwealth Writers' Prize and the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman, India's highest honor for overseas nationals. Dr. Mukulika Banerjee is Associate Professor in Social Anthropology in the Department of Anthropology here at the London School of Economics and is the founding director of the South Asia Center, Mukhlika joined LSE in 2009, prior to which she taught at University College London and before that at Oxford, from where she was also awarded her PhD on the nonviolent Khudai Khidmatgar movement in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in Pakistan. Her PhD was published as The Pathan Unarmed, Opposition and Memory in the Northwest Frontier in 2001. Interweaving the political into social anthropology to understand human behavior has been a core component of Mokulika's long-standing academic engagement with South Asia. She has authored, co-authored, and been editor of three more titles. Most recently, she published Why India Votes in 2014, the outcome of a major ESRC grant which breaks several methodological and conceptual grounds. Mokulika is currently working uh, on a book manuscript based on 15 years of ethnographic data collected from voters in rural India and their multivalent engagement with elections and voting activities in India. My name is Nilanjan Sarkar. I am Deputy Director of the South Asia Centre. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, even though we are the South Asia Center, we do start all our events on time. <laughs> this is unusual, and it's slightly, but only very slightly in consideration of our guest, who, as all of you here know, has been on a whirlwind tour talking about this book. Um, and we are delighted and, uh, that this is his final stop on this particular tour, which means we can have a really interesting conversation about all the things that he would have liked to have said and didn't or uh, <laughs> wants to talk about but is not nothing to do with the book at all. So I'll try and make it um, as interesting for him, really, that's the challenge, uh, and not ask him completely predictable questions, but of course this might be a total fail, so we'll see. And I thought what we might do is it's, it's quarter to seven, so you have enough time to ask him questions, which I'm sure you want to do. Uh, we'll try and end uh, our initial question and answer session by about um, 25 past seven. So we have about 20, 25 minutes for questions. So um, if, if I'll, I also promised Shashi that I would allow him some time to rest because he's been giving press interviews right up to uh, the start of this particular event. And I thought I would just note how opposite it is um, that we are talking about this book at LSE. Right? Um, LSE and India 
have had a very long relationship. And like long relationships, it's a complicated one. Uh, and it goes back right to the start of LSEs being set up when, uh, of course, and, and all these very important figures in the history of LSE feature in your book. So um, George Bernard Shaw, who was one of the, as you know, one of the four people fa who founded LSE, there's a wonderful quote from Shashi's book, which uh, if you'll allow me to reproduce, he said, when an Englishman wants something, he never publicly admits to his wanting it. Instead, his want is expressed as a, in quotes, a burning conviction that is a, it is his moral and religious duty to conquer those who possess the things he wants. Um, Durant, who he's also quoting, is scathing about this pretense, quote, hypocrisy was added to brutality while the robbery went on. And that's kind of what this book is about. Now, the other people setting up LSE at the time were, um, of course, it was Graham Wallace, but also Sydney and Beatrice Webb, who, when they needed to raise money, British universities have always needed support from all over the world, uh, landed up in India. And that story of the Webbs meeting uh, Tata, who then said, yes, I will fund you a post that will create academic knowledge that is socially useful, and the first holder of that post was Clement Attlee, who also plays, as you can imagine, a very important role in this book because he then goes on to become British Prime Minister at the time that India uh, gains freedom and independence in 1947. The Webbs also, I mean, there's a back and forth because when Jamshedpur is set up and the whole sort of planning of this whole new town, not just a steel plant, is imagine the webs go out to advise the Tatars on how to do it. And this story has of back and forth engagement right through the, the empire years, but also, of course, post 47 and all our students in the room. Um, these are uh, important, very important alumni, Ambedkar being the most illustrious, uh, Krishna Menon. And then, of course, we have key figures like I.G. Patel, who is governor of the Reserve Bank of India and then director of the London School of Economics, quite exceptional. Um, and then Amartya Sen and Manmohan Singh and, and many others. Fortunately, in this case for me, they're people from your political party. Um, so uh, that's why I can say it. I don't always mention it. Uh, but we are, they're people we'd like to own. And I have to say I'm particularly uh, pleased to welcome you formally to LSE. I remember being in Thiruvananthapuram on, in April 2009, just as you were contesting your first, first Lok Sabha election, and we were making a program for Radio 4. I remember uh, seeing you on the stump, so to speak, and were there on, on polling day. So it's very nice. It's, it's, a, it's been a long journey. Now, um, the first thing I thought I would... You really have to talk sometime. Are you ready to talk? I'm now? ready to talk. Or shall, I, <laughs> or shall I filibuster for a bit longer? You've done a good job, Angelica. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just hoping you weren't going to say that I was stumped when you said that you saw No, you me. were on the stump <laughs> on the election. No. Well, I've yet to see you stumped, but then, hey, the evening lies ahead. Who That's knows? right. It's your chance. This is your challenge, the audience. You've got, can you stump Shashi Tharoor? Uh, that's quite a tall ask. Now, you said, you know, we've all seen the Jon Snow clip which is like your Oxford Union debate has gone viral and everybody knows Jon Snow in this country and, and then you say to John that this is, you know, you said about the relationship between Britain and India when he says, is this going to get in the way of the trade deal we so badly need post-Brexit, which of course is a question on everybody's mind. You say, no, this is not about the present. And then you go on to say other things. And I wanted to start by asking you, is it really not about the present? <laughs> uh, is it not something that absolutely infuses all present interaction between Britain and India, either with, between the level of individuals but also institutions? No, I think that's a very good question, Mukudika, and great to see you all here this evening. Uh, because as all historians know, one of the reasons history is so interesting is because it really is present in our contemporary lives in one way or the other. I think that... Uh, walking through the impressive colonnaded buildings of London, many of which were built 
with money that came from the colonies is one way of reminding yourself. Um, seeing the number of brown and black faces in London is another reminder as one famous immigrant demonstration um, featured a placard that said, we are here because you were there, uh, which is also a reminder, a reminder of history uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the present. And there are many, many other reminders, it seems to me, um, including, of course, deliciously when England keeps losing to India at cricket. Uh, that is also a reminder of how we acquired the game in the first place. But jokes apart, I think that one of the uh, reasons I said what I said was that I didn't want my desire that people should embrace history whole to affect things like contemporary geopolitical relationships. Because um, to my mind today, we are not just two sovereign equal nations, but our economy has actually nominally exceeded the British economy. Of course, we have far more people, so in per capita terms, we're a long way behind, but we now have as substantial an economy in the world as Britain does, and it's silly for us to regard Britain with a chip on the shoulder. So to that degree, I didn't want my book to feed into some sort of narrative of victimhood. That's not what this is about. Yeah. This is really about confronting the past for its own sake, uh, embracing it whole and seeing it, warts and all, and to some degree compensating for the extraordinarily distorted versions of popular history that have managed to gain so much traction in the last 15 or 20 years. If you look at the books about the British Empire in India, uh, and sometimes more than just India, but let's say the British Empire, that have become uh, widely reviewed, highly praised bestsellers uh, in the English-speaking world, you find the names of Professor Neil Ferguson, of Lawrence James, of Andrew Roberts, uh, of people who have consistently tried to show the empire uh, in, in a glamorous and positive light, or in, in Neil Ferguson's memorable words, as a jolly good thing with a capital G and a capital T. Well, it wasn't a jolly good thing. And uh, the fact that Indians have learned over the years to forgive and forget, um, I think is, is actually not that good. I want them to forgive, and I'll tell you why in a second, but I don't want them to forget. I say I want them to forgive because it doesn't do anybody any good to go around harboring hatred and resentment of anyone else. Um, in fact, Gandhiji, Mahatma Gandhi, when he wrote to the Viceroy saying, I regard British rule in India to be a sin. And this is a very moral man, as you know, so for him, sin was a very strong piece of invective. He also, of course, at the same time, implicitly espoused the philosophy that uh, once the sin ceased, um, you didn't have to worry about the sinner because the sinner was no longer a sinner. So it was always hate the sin and not the sinner. That was the Gandhian approach to these things. Uh, it is said, and there is the anecdote in the book, that when Churchill asked Nehru a few years after independence, how is it, despite the fact that we locked you up for about 10 years of your life in British jails, that you bear no bitterness or rancor towards us? And Nehru is said to have replied, I was taught by a great man, namely the Mahatma, never to fear and never to hate, which I think is actually a good thing. It's a virtue. And I certainly don't hate, and I don't think very many Indians hate uh, the British. But I think it is right to want to have an accurate record, an accurate understanding of the 200 years of, of history that uh, preceded our independence that left us in the condition in which we were left, from which we had to start building up the modern India, whose 70th anniversary of independence we celebrate this year. And therefore, I thought it was important to understand this context fully, and in, this, in so doing, to provide an answer to all those uh, romanticizers and deniers who are out there in such uh, large and impressive numbers. So what would the Mahatma say to the British? since you like counterfactuals. <laughs> He'd say I'm very old today. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I think that, that he would say you did a good thing in, in acknowledging the error of your ways. I mean, he thought in those moral terms. And he would always say, essentially, um, it's a question of rights and wrongs. So, for example, when he, when he was arrested in, in many of his early court cases, 
what would he say? He would say, I think your law is bad, but hmm. since it is your law, he would say to the judge, I have broken it, and you must give me the most severe punishment you can under the law. But your law is bad. You shouldn't have passed that law. But since it's there, please punish me, and I will willingly accept the punishment. He really was a very unusual character, Mahatma Gandhi, and this was uh, one of those things. So once the, the British had left, I think his, his, his attitude probably was in those few months that he lived after their departure, uh, one of, um, now that you've gone, there's nothing to reproach you for anymore. But it's more a question of, the question I'm trying to get at here is, in the current climate, something that again you said on, on the Jon Snow uh, interview, but also one that has been occasionally comes up in public debate and conversation. I mean, look at the audience here. How many of, how many of you actually have been to the UK schooling system in this room? Quite a few. How many of you actually read in some detail about the empire in India? Yeah. But in school, it's part of your curriculum? No. So, so these are people who read on their own. Or had parents, as I do with my child, uh, force it down her throat, make sure she uh, learns that story, as, as, as we should. Or indeed, there are some schools that have very enlightened history teachers. But the point is... But you can actually do your A-levels in history in this country today and not, and not actually yeah. learn a line of colonial history. Indeed. So this amnesia that you've been talking about, this historical amnesia, how important, you know, and that's why I was saying that the counterfactual of Gandhi today, what would be the Gandhian response to the historical amnesia? Um, gosh, that's a tough one. I, I'm not an authority on Gandhi per se. I've written a biography of Nehru. Uh, but Gandhi, I, 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 I would say, uh, judging by his own writings, was much less concerned with the past than with the here and now and possibly the future. Um, I don't see a great deal, whereas Nehru, for example, was brilliant on history, mm. whether it was the history of India that he discovered or the history of the world that he wrote to his daughter about. Mahatma Gandhi's writings are curiously devoid of much historical context or depth. I think his entire logic would have been, I was showing you the, the fact that you were doing something very wrong in being here and ruling us. Now that you've gone, great, have a good life. I mean, that, that would be his attitude, I think. But I'm not an, ex an expert on Gandhiji's works in quite the same way as I should be. No, I think, I mean, it's more a question of, of whether he would, in order for Britain to overcome its embarrassment, neglect, amnesia about its past, needs to confront it in order to move on, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's what, what was your very good soundbite on that? How can you know where you're going if you that's, don't know and If you, you don't know where you've come from, how will you appreciate where you're going? I think that's right. something that's important for young people particularly yes. to think about because just as each of us as individuals wants to know, you know a little bit about our parents or our grandparents, where we come from, uh, the history of the name we bear, what it implies, it'll be odd for us as a collective civilization to have no sense of our past. And, you know, for 200 years, the British presence was the single most significant factor for anybody who's Indian today. Uh, and I think not knowing about it, not facing up to it, not being aware of it is, is actually uh, wrong. It's an omission that we would, we would pay for. But equally, I think the British people need to know about what they did for 200 years around the world. But I really don't think you should be reading Jane Austen without realizing that the lifestyle she depicts was paid for by slaves toiling away on the sugar plantations of the Caribbean. Uh, that you should, uh, you should be unconscious uh, of the extraordinary impact uh, of, of uh, imperial wealth, the wealth drained from the colonies on what Britain was able to achieve in the world. Indian soldiers fought in something like 17, 18 different uh, major campaigns in which Britain expanded its empire. I've listed them in the book. Uh, the First World War would not have been fought successfully without Indian men and Indian money. A million Indian soldiers served under arms um, for the British in the First World War. India supplied cash, vast quantities of it, uh, food, clothing, vehicles, uh, uh, expertise of various sorts. Even rail lines were ripped out of the ground and shipped off to aid the British war effort. And the first German invasion at Ypres was stopped by Indian forces, the British hadn't recruited their uh, army yet to fight a war that they hadn't really planned to fight. So um, 
All of this is something that's largely unknown. The monetary value of the, British, uh, of, the, of the Indian contribution to Britain's effort to fight the First World War has been estimated in today's money as something like 80 billion pounds. So when people talk about how British aid to India after independence is more than made up for whatever they took, I think, how many, you haven't even paid for the First World War yet, let alone anything else. <laughs> mm. So I, you've mentioned the Raj apologists uh, just now earlier. Mm. If, have, do you think any of them might review your book? I hope they will. The publishers would love it if, if we had some really nasty reviews that will spike sales further. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm really not. I don't want them nasty. Please be nice to me. Are you uh, sure it's going to be nasty, though? No, you know, interestingly enough, um, some of the encounters I've had on this week here, uh, I spoke at the House of Lords. Uh, we've had a couple of British conservative peers present, and they've been actually very polite and respectful. Um, uh, no, no, I mean, I... I don't mean that, uh, I mean, what what, one do? of them said very, very, very correctly, as a conservative, I believe we should have traded. I don't believe we should have conquered. So I have no quarrel with what you're saying. Uh, so, I mean, the libertarian strain of the conservative uh, movement would see it that way, whereas obviously there were others who gloried um, in the flatulence of Rudyard Kipling, for example, and <laughs> sung songs about the white man's burden and so on. But, but for many others, that was not true. I mean, I... Uh, at Cambridge, uh, uh, Simon Heffer, the conservative columnist from The Telegraph, was asked to comment, and he was actually quite constructive and positive. So, uh, so far, I haven't had any direct pushback. Yes, I had an irate caller on, um, on uh, the BBC's Asian network who wanted an exact accounting of how many buildings I believe India paid for in London. I said, I don't know. <laughs> but he said, no, you can't say that buildings... I'm sorry. I mean, there are detailed accounts of how much money was remitted here. And, uh, and, and indeed, throughout the 19th century, um, the accounts were rather transparent because um, India was, was, was remitting vast sums to the British Exchequer right through the 19th century. An English writer called William Digby wrote a book in 1901, which I've cited in my volume, in which he actually did a detailed accounting down to the last pound, shilling, and pence. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not exactly as if this money was uh, disappearing into the ether. It was coming here and financing uh, the Industrial Revolution, financing grand buildings, financing expeditions around the world to expand the British Empire. Um, India paid for a lot of what Britain became. Uh, by the, the, in the glory days of the early 20th century. One statistic is that when in 1700 India was the richest country in the world, 27% of global GDP, according to Angus Madison, the British econometric historian, at that time Britain's share of global GDP was 1.8%. So that's 1700. Fast forward to 1947, India is down below 4% of global GDP and Britain is up at 10 uh, as the Soviets used to say in the communist days, it is no accident, comrades. <laughs> and have you done any talks in Scotland? Actually, not yet. But I should point out that the Scots were actually extremely unsuccessful colonists. Uh, you know, they tried to go off to colonize Central America and Darien and Panama and so on, failed spectacularly. And then came the union with Britain, which made suddenly colonization possible because they were able to jump on the English bandwagon in India. And it's very interesting that, that uh, Scots were disproportionately represented uh, in the British Raj in India. I think three times their population in terms of positions in both the civilian and the military establishment in India were occupied by Scots. Um, and, uh, and what's striking about that, of course, is that now that, uh, the in now that India is no longer there, it's not surprising that the bonds of union are slightly loosening these days. But anyway, I think it really was a big advantage to Scotland. I'd love to hear Nicola Sturgeon's riposte to that claim <laughs> that the referendum can now be explained for the loss of India. Interesting. <laughs> Somebody tweet it. Tag her. You know, let's see what she says. Um, in, um, I was very struck. Well, I've been invited to speak in Scotland in August. Come to Excellent. think of it, I'd forgotten that. At the Edinburgh Festival? Uh, no, at the Beyond Borders Festival. Okay, fantastic. Mm. Well, we'll watch that space. You will say this then. I shall. I shall begin with it, Mukulik. I just see you. <laughs> if I go, I'm not sure that I can make the, make the time, but if I do, I will. Um, one, in a couple of places, I couldn't find a typical. You read a book, you find a word, and then you look for it, it's not there. 
But um, in a couple of places, I think you say you write as a nationalist, right? Um, and you, you're writing this account with a fierce sense of nationalism, which I share, recognize. What, what is nationalism? Since you've talked about, you've talked about Tagore, uh, whose writings on nationalism, of course, I mean, Tagore says there's no Indian word. That, that, that's the quote you have, right, for nationalism. In today's India, how, what is it to be a nationalist? Well, it's hugely contested territory because, unfortunately, we have people associated with the ruling dispensation in the country today who are propagating an extremely narrow-minded and even bigoted um, view of, of, of the country's ethos and, and marketing it as nationalism. Whereas to me, nationalism um, in the Indian context has to be hugely uh, expensive and inclusive, um, simply because that's what it was. I mean, as Nehru described it so beautifully in the discovery of India, India was like this ancient palimpsest on which successive waves of different kinds of people, of different origins, different faiths, different ways of being, wrote and each wrote on top of the other without erasing what had been written before. And this palimpsest is cumulatively what India is. Everybody can belong. Again, in the first 20 years of the Indian National Congress's existence, the presidents of the party came from every Indian faith. They were Muslims, Christians, Parsis, as well as Hindus. And what is striking was, at a time when in the entire British Empire, there was no British woman who ever enjoyed a position of any consequence in the empire, there were two white women who were presidents of the Indian National Congress. Annie Besant of Irish origin and Nellie Sengupta, who was, in, it was English. Um, and what's striking about this is not just the fact that Indian nationalism could embrace two women, so it was not, uh, 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 shall we say, gender insensitive, but that it was not even um, uh, willing to give a racial or ethnic connotation to the idea of nationalism and nationhood. It said that as long as you want to come to India, be part of it, immerse yourself in the adventure that is Indianness, be um, with us, and, and, and my God, we've had our first walkouts already. Uh, <laughs> um, nationalism is... Nationalism is, 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 yes, well, it's all right. I think um, you're not excluded. You're welcome to stay as far as I'm concerned, even if you disagree with me. Uh, but I just want to stress that, uh, that this kind of incredibly inclusive nationalism, a cross-cutting across boundaries of race, of religion, of creed, of gender, of caste, of everything else, that, to my mind, was what Indian nationalism is all, is all about, and that's the nationalism of which I speak. Whereas those who would reduce Indian nationalism to a particular religion, in fact, a particular interpretation of a particular religion, are, in my view, doing a, a great deal of disservice, uh, almost violence, to the true ideas uh, of Indian nationalism that the nationalist movement itself developed and articulated. So when you talk about this book in India, and of course I have the, for those of you, uh, this is the Indian uh, edition which came out last year, so people have had a chance to read it. It came out what, at the end of last year, so it's been around a few months, about right. three months, yeah. So have there been much discussion about it? Is it, has it reflected on ideas of nationalism, <laughs> of the historical amnesia that India herself has expressed it since 47 of all the things that it's got wrong already. Well, it's curious, Mukulika, that a lot of Indians, uh, not, not even just the book, but the book goes back to the speech of the Oxford Union debate, um, a lot of Indians keep coming up to me even today, mm -hmm. um, uh, indicating that it had opened their eyes, that they, they didn't know all of the stuff. I mean, I, I resist saying, but you obviously weren't paying attention in history yes, class, you know, but the fact is that the, the textbooks have some of the stuff or a lot of the stuff. I think what I've mainly done in this book is to put it all together and accompanied with the refutation of the counter arguments that have been made on the British side of the, of the debate. It isn't a dry narrative history. It is an impassioned argument. Uh, some would call it, I'm sure, a polemical one, but it's one that actually makes a case and refutes the other case. That's what the book is all about. Um, it's done well in India. It's, it's actually, um, uh, I guess, in hardback, my best-selling book ever of the, of the uh, 16 I've written. It sold something approaching 30,000 copies in hardback, and it's still only in hardback, so people who want to buy it months, have to wait gosh. in three months. So it's, by Indian standards, that's pretty serious for a non-fiction book. That's, that's reasonably, um, that's actually very 
successful. In the, in the context of, um, of the sort of public debates on nationalism, uh, since I was already a participant in those debates, I'd already been asked to express my views and that my voice was known. I, I, I wasn't real. The book didn't become, if you like, an excuse to inject myself into it again. Um, but one question that came up, and perhaps I'm anticipating something you were going to ask anyway, that did come up in India when the book came out is, aren't you afraid this will play into the sort of ultra-right narrative that seeks to use nationalism in a, in a slightly negative way. And I said, I don't think so, for two reasons. First of all, because mine is the more inclusive version uh, of nationalism, perhaps too inclusive for their taste. But the second is also that there is a, a genuine disagreement over history. I, mean, I speak of 200 years of foreign rule. Uh, many of the people on the Hindutva side of the ledger speak of 1,200 years of foreign rule. To them, every Muslim ruler was also a foreigner. To me, there is a big difference between those who came to our country, plundered it, and f left with lots of our goodies uh, and, and assets and wealth, and those who came, as did the Mughals and, and, and many of the sultans before them, stayed in India, married in India, assimilated here, thought of India as their home, never owed allegiance to the foreign lands they or their ancestors had left. And if at all they did loot, they spent their loot in India. And in many cases, and certainly if you look at the Mughals, they enriched India with art, architecture, sculpture, painting, music, imported from the lands um, uh, to our north, to which they may have had a historical or cultural affinity in the past, but which they now drew from to enrich us. And to my mind, they are therefore unquestionably Indian rulers and not foreign ones. And there's, if you like, more than an ideological difference. Uh, because to my mind, foreign rule was because the British came with their allegiance completely elsewhere. Uh, their purpose was to drain India of its resources and send it to England, which they did systematically, as they recorded. Um, they had no commitment to India. Even when sometimes entire generations of a family served in India, home was still always England. Uh, it is estimated that on average, an, an, a British Indian civil servant sent 80% of his salary back. Uh, one sort of trivial footnote is that luxury goods industries in India practically collapsed during the British rule because whereas, you know, the jewelers and craftsmen and, 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 and fancy expensive fabric makers and so on had thrived on the largesse of the aristocracy around the courts, uh, suddenly the people who were now the new ruling caste uh, had no interest in these goods. They were interested in stuff made in London and Paris, and, and that, that's where their, their discretionary luxury spending went. So all of these things, they had really no commitment whatsoever uh, to India. And that's what, my, to my mind, makes them foreign rulers, um, if, you, if you see the distinction. Yes. Whereas um, uh, the people I'm arguing with extend that term to a much larger sort of In fact, cast of characters than I would. Yeah, I think uh, some of the, I, I have to say for those of you who haven't read the book, I urge you to read it. Uh, it is fantastically well written and very, very pacey, and it keeps holds your attention, which is remarkable. There are really not that many nonfiction books that do that successfully. Thank you. Um, uh, but and I, you know, there are books on sale, and Shashi will be signing copies. And I'm not doing this because I get a cut from the author <laughs> or the publishers. I barely I, got one myself. <laughs> Publishers, you know, it's their business. But I want to be read, so please do read. Me. Yeah, no, it's worth reading. But we'll talk about more uh, that uh, a little bit more uh, towards the end. But I do, uh, partly because this is your last event on the Roadshow in London, Shashi, I wonder whether you could think about this, if I could push you to think about this a little bit more, that there is absolutely, I, you know, I... I I and many others and, you know, who are reading the book totally buy this argument about the injustices of colonialism. Are we prepared as Indians to take equal responsibility for not having the historical amnesia that the British did, for being able to say in 70 years what we got wrong, to be held accountable for it, and to apologize in a way that uh, we would like the British colonial government too. Yes, I mean, actually, um, uh, there is, I think, a stock taking taking place, of which my book has certainly been one of the catalysts and perhaps um, among the more visible catalysts right now. Um, 
But there has to be some distinctions drawn. I mean, I, I think the government of India should actually stay out of this. This has to be something in Indian society. The intellectual ferment should be in academia, in the public uh, uh, commentaries, in the opinion pages, in, on television discussions. But um, I, as an Indian, would be deeply embarrassed if the government of India demanded an apology from Britain. I will demand it, and I think, I think um, when I do so, I, I speak in almost Gandhian language of the need for moral atonement. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, I think that Britain, for its own sake, needs to look back at its last 200 years, not the last 200, 200 from before the midpoint of the last century, uh, look back at its conduct and ask itself whether it doesn't indeed have anything to atone for. I was told about this astonishing tweet by a British cabinet minister over the weekend that said that Britain has got nothing to be ashamed of uh, in its history. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, I think almost every country has something to be ashamed of, but Britain has a lot more to be ashamed of than most. Um, and, and I was asked this on, on a television show, and I began saying, well, you could start off with the Great Bengal Famine when 4.3 million people died because of decisions taken by Winston Churchill. I was interrupted right there. But uh, I, I could have gone on to the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. I could have gone on to uh, uh, a dozen instances, the strafing of the Iraqis from the air, the chemical weapons used in Basra. I mean, you name it. This was a, uh, an empire with an awful lot of unpleasantness uh, to look back upon in its own history. But coming back specifically to India, um, I have said, and I will say to you, all of you as well, that the, there are a couple of very good examples I would commend to the British. The Social Democratic Chancellor of Germany, Willy Brandt, going to the Warsaw Ghetto in 1970 and falling to his knees in apology and contrition uh, for what the Nazis had done to the Polish people, particularly the Polish Jews, was an amazing gesture. I mean... Brandt was totally innocent of any taint of Nazi wrongdoing. Social Democrats like him were actually persecuted by the Nazis. But he felt as head of the German government that he had a certain responsibility on behalf of the German people to apologize for and therefore to expiate the collective sin, the collective guilt that Germany bore for what had been done in Poland. More recently, last year, the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, stood up in the Canadian Parliament to apologize to the people of India for the Komagata Maru incident. For those of you who don't know what that is, it was a Japanese ship, the Komagata Maru, on which a number of Indian refugees, a large number of Indian refugees, sailing uh, to Canada were turned away at the port of Vancouver. And most of them actually met a rather grisly end, either on the high seas or at the hands of the British afterwards. But the Canadians didn't directly kill anybody themselves. Still, Trudeau felt he had to apologize, and he did so. Uh, even though this is 100 years ago, and obviously nobody alive uh, in uh, Canada today, least of all in his party or his government, has any responsibility for that decision and, and what was happening at that time. But the turning away was done in the name of the Canadian people, and today in the name of the Canadian people he apologizes. What I would like very much is for Britain to look hard and fresh at the upcoming centenary of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, the Amritsar Massacre, I believe, is what some of you know it as, 1919, the 13th of April, when in, a, in an act of unprovoked and wanton cruelty, a British Brigadier General Dyer, Reginald Dyer, opened fire on a large number of unarmed, unprotesting men, women, and children gathered as families to commemorate Baisakhi, the, the spring festival uh, that's celebrated in Punjab. And these people died uh, in droves. I mean, practically every bullet found a target. Uh, the British reluctantly acknowledged 379 dead in 15 minutes of firing. The Indians claimed over 1,000. The truth is probably somewhere in between. But the, the, the horrible thing about that massacre was not just the killings and the numbers, um, which really were uh, astonishingly uh, low by comparison with some of the other things the British had done. The British killed 100,000 people in reprisals in Delhi in 1858 after the so-called mutiny. So it's not just numbers I'm talking about. It's the entire nature of the killing and the context and the aftermath that followed. For 24 hours, Dyer wouldn't let the families tend to the dead, the dying, and the wounded. Their bodies were allowed to rot in the hot sun. Families standing outside the gates while their loved ones moaned piteously for water that they couldn't give them. Uh, Indians were ordered to crawl on their bellies on a street 
uh, not far away, uh, where uh, an English woman was said to have been assaulted. And, um, and, and if they so much as lifted their heads while they were crawling, they were hit on the head, bashed on the head with British staves. Uh, one atrocity after another, I've enumerated them in the book in, in greater detail. At the end of all of this, uh, the public outcry was so great that even the attempt to exonerate him in a public commission of inquiry didn't work very well. The House of Commons passed a resolution criticizing him. The House of Lords promptly passed another resolution praising him for the massacre. And the British in India collected large sums of money whipped on by the British press here uh, to give him the equivalent in today's money of a quarter of a million pounds reward for killing people uh, in, in, in Jallianwala Bagh together with a bejeweled sword. And that flatulent voice of Victorian imperialism, Rudyard Kipling, called him the man who saved India. Saved what in India? Saved India for whom? In fact, that act probably helped lose India for the British because it made nationalists out of a lot of people who had so far thought they might cooperate with the Brits. Uh, now this atrocity, so both the killing, the wanton brutality, the indifference to Indian suffering, the self-justification later, the celebration and reward for evil, all of this cumulatively makes us, to, for me, the emblematic worst atrocity of the British Raj. So imagine if a member of a British royal family, after all, everything was done in the name of the crown, came to Jallianwala Bagh in April 2019 on the centenary, and ideally on bended knee, but otherwise in whatever form, chose to express contrition and remorse for this act. And remember, atonement must come from within. I mean, it, it can't be imposed on. It's rather like love. You, you've got to feel it. Uh, people can't tell you you've got to love. People can't tell you to feel sorry. But if that is then expressed, what an amazing effect it would have, what an amazingly cleansing effect it would have on the, on the, on the entire uh, effect, uh, on the entire sort of sin, as it were, to use Gandhi's phrase, that had been committed by the British over 200 years. We have two years to 2019. It's a campaign worth, uh, I think it's going to, it's, it has to be part of a public conversation and some, not, not once you've left on a whirlwind tour and moved on to the next continent, I think this is a conversation that needs to continue in Britain. And in India, and it's up to you whether you want to ask this, answer the question or not, but I'm going to put it to you anyway is do you think we as a civilization, as a country, have the stature to morally atone for 1984, for 2002? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think India needs, uh, on, on many, many instances, and not just those two, to give apologies to, to its own people. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, on behalf of the Congress Party, did express uh, apologies uh, for 1984. It came rather late more than two decades after the tragedy. Um, and I think, I think um, uh, it should have been expressed sooner. Um, uh, because what one is apologizing for is not just that something happened, but that something was allowed to happen. It was condoned by those who had the power to prevent it from happening when it happened. That, I think, is the same logic that I would apply to 2002, for which no apology has been expressed. But the fact is that when wrong is done, those who were in a position to prevent that wrong owe to the victims and their survivors and their, their legatees a, a profound apology. And I think certainly uh, that is necessary. And I think uh, I, I do wish that in the case of 1984, it had come sooner, it had come louder, it had come, um, um, shall we say, without so much of bitterness having had mm. been spread. I can understand why, I suppose, because there was, sadly, um, a sort of a secessionist movement, uh, as it were, that was also flourishing at that time, and any statement that might have been seen as giving aid and comfort to the secessionists would not have been uh, deemed politically wise. Uh, I think that's a pity that call was made that way. But anyway, better late than never, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that... Um, that people are now facing up to the facts of their own past and saying we were wrong, that that needs to be apologized for. Thank you. Thank you for answering it. Um, final question, but, you know, we can, we can talk about it. I can open it up. Um, it's very striking, the, the tone of the book. is It's beautifully written, but it's also understandably very angry. Is that the way the history of the vanquished is going to be, has to be written? 
Well, you know the, the old line, uh, suppose we're an African proverb, that, um, that uh, until the lions find their own scribes, the history of the hunt will always be written by the hunters. Um, I hope that this is a small contribution to the lions finding their own voice. Um, it is written sometimes in anger, but I hope in restrained anger. I have not used any invective. I have not, no. um, I have not exceeded the bounds of um, propriety in a written text. But yes, there, is, there are moments when I'm clearly seething, moments when I'm close to tears, and moments when my blood is boiling. And I suspect and hope that some readers will feel exactly those emotions on reading what I felt when I was writing this. Great. Thank you. Okay, we'll take some. We have about... 15 to 17 minutes to take some questions. So, yeah, the gentleman in the blue shirt over there. Who ha I think you've got to run, my trail. Which one? Back. Back. Top left. It won't catch on the podcast, so just hang on for the mic. Please keep your questions very brief and make it a question, not a comment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tharoor, can I firstly add my thanks for writing this book? Um, it's been a pleasure reading it. I've got a fresh copy from Bombay Airport last night. Oh, the oh, one oh. that I read is actually no jet quite, lag. I'm impressed. Quite, quite heavily. Yeah, well, um, I've got a large copy here. Um, the copy that I actually read is quite heavily dog-eared um, dog and uh, pockmarked and whatever else. Um, one, one of the effects of colonial uh, India's colonial history is that we have ended up absorbing potentially uh, the effects of colonialism and clinging to it and perhaps making it part of our history um, and our fabled history. One such subject, uh, and we see that in many laws, colonial laws that persist today. One such subject is perhaps section 377 yeah. of the Indian Penal Code, uh, which has been absorbed uh, and claimed by various parts of the Indian body politic as being particularly Indian whereas we know that it isn't. Um, okay. You had moved a um, private member's bill on this subject last year, uh, or, or perhaps a couple of years ago, I, I don't remember exactly when. Um, what do you see, as part of Indians claiming their post-colonial voice, or perhaps even their pre-colonial voice, what do you see as the prospect uh, for sexual minorities in India in this instance, uh, but perhaps Indian culture more largely before it was touched by the British being reclaimed by India in the 21st century. Thank Very you. well said. I mean, the truth is that uh, this is, this is a, a very good example, uh, which is why I mention it in the book as well, of precisely this problem that the British essentially come and transform India through Im imposing their moral code and their values upon a system that has been uh, historically uh, and for a couple of thousand years extremely open and permissive on matters of sexual behavior. And if you have any doubts, go and check out a few Indian temples and you'll see what I mean. Uh, there pretty much isn't any, 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 any posture that hasn't been depicted in, temple, in temple sculptures and uh, depicted and, and described in great detail in the Kama Sutra and so on. This was not a prudish society. The Victorians were prudes. And they came in and imposed their, their, their moral code on Indians. And, and uh, uh, unfortunately, we internalized it uh, for 100 years with the result that we are unnecessarily criminalizing what traditionally ancient India had recognized as normal human behavior for some human beings. Now, anyway, I did try, as you rightly said, to, to get this uh, section of the penal code removed. I tried and failed twice in Parliament. Um, outvoted by a rather vociferously uh, active bunch of bigots on both occasions. <laughs> and um, I think at the end of the day, I feel we have no choice but to rely on the judiciary uh, to rethink their earlier judgment. I mean, there, there is a curative review petition pending at the Supreme Court, uh, which a lot of you know, people have come out in public and supported, uh, including people who might have feared paying a price for their avowal of their orientation uh, in the context of, of Indian uh, hypocrisy today on these matters. Um, but the, the case has, a, I mean, the court has a lot of cases in its dockets, and uh, this hasn't moved up the uh, priority list very much, and we're still waiting uh, more than a year now for the Supreme Court to, uh, to hear it. They agreed a year ago to hear it, but they haven't actually listed it, as the term goes, 
to, to listen to it. But I'm afraid that's the only way it's going to work. And it's very interesting how the British essentially were able to persuade Indians that their morality was actually good Indian middle class values. I'm going to take two questions together okay. so that we can fit more. And please do keep them very brief. The compliments can come later. Um, <laughs> thank you. Just so we can get everybody as many in. Yeah. Thank you very I much. I don't mind indeed. going over a little late if you want. For the compliments, right? Yeah. <laughs> Especially <laughs> for the compliments. Yeah, the yes. sake of, okay. Fair enough. You've thank, heard you, them. Th thank you very much indeed, Dr. Thoreau. Um, I've not read your book yet. I had two very brief questions. The first is, you spoke about loot and about goodies. Do you believe there is a case, or do you believe there should be a case for financial reparations? And if not, why not? And the second question is, how much space is there in your narrative for British anti-colonialists? How much? British space for British anti-colonialists in your narrative. Right. Yeah. And let's take another one. There's a lady in the front well, of the section. Well, there already. <laughs> Two people, not two questions. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Uh, Dr. Thrur, as a person who's always advocated for freedom of expression and with your inclusive definition of nationalism, as you discussed, what do you feel about uh, what recently happened at Ramjas College and the growing kind of definition of what a nationalist is in the anti-nationalist and the right-wing perspective? Right. OK. Uh, so, so, so going back to, to your thing first, reparations were in fact the topic of the Oxford University debate that sparked off all of this. But even there I said, look, uh, we really can't put a value on the human lives lost because of British colonialism and the theft that took place over the point. Uh, uh, so let's, let's just be content with a symbolic one pound a year for the next 200 years to make up for the last 200. But that was partly a joke. It was a way of owning up to the topic of the debate as assigned by the Union um, without really entering into the merits of reparations. The truth is that once you start trying to value what the British took from India, you would get a sum so astronomical that it could not possibly be paid. I mean, for example, one Indian journalist did a calculation and came up with over three trillion, which obviously would exceed the GDP of all of Britain. Um, so my problem is since any sum that is credible would not be payable, and any sum that is payable would not be credible, why bother with reparations? I think let's, let's leave the past in the past, and instead I think the act of atonement, consisting of the apology and of, of instruction in the school system, would go a long way. I mean, I, I, I'm, 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 as I, I mean, obviously I have no right to speak for all of India in this regard, but I, I'm, I'm reasonably content with leaving it that way. In fact, I, I tend to push back at people in India who try and use history to sort of seek revenge on various things. In fact, the week this book came out in India, uh, where it was released by the Vice President, actually, of India, uh, three days later, Theresa May arrived in Delhi on her first official visit as Prime Minister. And after Delhi, she went on to Bombay and Hyderabad and Bangalore to look for investments in her post-Brexit economy from Indian capitalists. So I said, you know, you don't need to revenge yourself upon history. History is its own revenge. <laughs> On British anti-colonialists, I don't know very much, to be quite honest. I'm assuming there are anti-colonial voices in Britain, just judging by the sympathies expressed by some of you. I hope you will express yourselves in the public press and not only in The Guardian, where I do read some <laughs> anti-colonial voices, but also in other places. Uh, on the question of narrow interpretations of nationalism, this recent incident in Delhi University was shameful. I did speak out um, in support of the protesters and against those who tried to silence them. And of course I got the inevitable trolling from the, the, the right wing. Um, the people who had disrupted the, the protest demonstration, you know the whole story, for those who don't, very simply there was a, 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 a seminar called at which a couple of speakers were invited had been associated with an earlier protest at Jawaharlal Nehru University that the ruling party and its followers had deemed to be anti-national. Uh, because of their protests, these two speakers were disinvited, at which point the organizers of the seminar canceled the seminar and took out a protest demonstration instead to protest the muzzling of the voices of these two people. That demonstration was not just attacked by the student wing of the ruling party, but was actually disrupted with physical violence. People were pushed, shoved, beaten, hit. Uh, even a professor 
had his ribs smashed in this. It was a di- disgraceful affair. And they were incredibly self-righteous about it, saying we were doing this against anti-national forces, which is just the kind of language, of course, that the Hitler Youth used to use in, in Germany in the 1930s. Um, Obviously, people like me spoke up in favor of the students, whether we agree with their politics or not, we don't agree with the demonstration, to which the pushback I got was, these people are anti-national, they were shouting anti-national slogans, they want to break up India, and you defend them. And I said, the answer to slogans, the answer to what they're saying is words. It's not violence. Give them your own words back. Make a reasoned argument. But I think whoever resorts to violence has already lost the debate. Thank you. Um, there's a lady here in the middle. Yeah. How much time? I have time. I have time. Yeah, Hi, I have one question for you. Um, say, if, miraculously, if they do atone and apologize tomorrow, uh, what would be next for you? Because your goal would have been achieved. And, <laughs> and uh, what kind of life is full of goals? <laughs> I assure you, like like and a footballer. Kind of, uh, one goes on from goal to goal. On British psyche. I'm sorry. What kind of effect would it have on British psyche, on the British people, if their leader apologized? Well, I think, obviously, if, if somebody in, a, in an important position in this country, as I said, whether a prime minister or a prince or princess or whatever uh, happened to apologize, I think very clearly the British people would then find it impossible to ignore. They would be forced to introspect. The great advantage of the apology is not just the apology for itself, which has great value, as I said, as a cleansing act, but it would actually also serve as a catalyst to an exercise in introspection, which I think has been overdue for 70 years. I think the British people, if they saw uh, a member of the royal family apologizing, would suddenly be obliged to ask themselves, what are these people apologizing for? What did we do? Let's find out more about it. And I think that would actually be very healthy as well. I mean, I can tell you that um, um, after the Second World War, An entire generation of Germans didn't say a word about the Nazis and about the war to their children. Germans of my age, uh, or slightly older to me as well, uh, grew up oblivious of, because their fathers all had fought in the war, had been uh, in the Nazi party and so on, couldn't bring themselves to talk about it. They preferred to brush it completely under the carpet. There was a conspiracy of silence. And then a generation later, say in about 1980 onwards, they went absolutely in the other direction. And the Germans are busing school children to the concentration camps to show them, to show them what atrocities were done in the name of their people. So never again gets a real meaning. And I think this, this sort of thing, now you've got a couple of generations of young Germans who, are, who recoil in horror at what the Nazis had done in the name of the German people. Look at London. You've got an imperial war museum. Do you have an imperial colonialism museum? When are you going to associate the word imperial with some of the cruelties, injustice, appropriate, misappropriation, theft that colonialism was really all about. I mean, you didn't go there for any other reason but that you had profits to be made. You made them. Well, now it's time, isn't it, to face up to them too? So that's the next goal is to set up a good museum here Excellent. on colonialism. We've got two already. We've got the 2019, I think, yeah, there's a young lady here. Hi, thank you, Dr. Tharoor, and thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Um, thanks for being here. My name is Anya, and I um, want to advocate. I know that you advocate more of a symbolic sort of reparation, so a pound a year for 200 years, and you don't. Uh, it's impossible to administer them. So <laughs> no finance minister would be happy with that solution. <laughs> and you don't view government to government aid as necessarily, you know, needed in in India today. However, one could argue that there's another way the former empire could support the former colony while also contributing to a larger global movement. As you mentioned, there's been an immense amount of stolen from India over the 200-year period, and this wealth could have supported India in its development, both human and economic, but today it faces the task of developing at a higher cost to the complications that come with industrializing using coal and oil. Now with carbon taxes and permits, developing countries do not share the same playing field as the West did and face even more vulnerability in the face of climate change. So what is your opinion on the UK offering support to the building of infrastructure and financing renewable energy production in India as a means to, one, symbolically pay damages, and two, support the fight against climate change, which is a win-win for everyone? We well, teach it, our students very well. I can that see that. Is, it, it, it's uh, a, it's a, well it's done, but that's not how to ask a question. For everybody who follows, keep them short, please. But well done. Okay, so uh, very simply, I'll give you a short answer. 
I think it's, it's, very, it's a very good idea. It's a very necessary thing to do, but not, I think, necessary to conflate it with colonialism. I do believe that the developed world, by which I include not just Britain, but countries like the U.S. and others, should, in fact, uh, transfer green technologies to the developing world. For, for at least 200 years since the Industrial Revolution, or 150 years, these are the countries that have destroyed the environment. These are the countries that have polluted the planet. These are the countries that have caused greenhouse gases emissions and, and global warming. Today, they have discovered the virtues of the environment, and they seek to impose it upon countries that are only beginning now to develop and get their people out of, out of, out of dire uh, economic conditions. Today, there are still 300 to 400 million Indians who cannot take for granted what any English person, American, Australian, Austrian can take for granted, which is to flick a switch on a wall and, and have your room bathed with light. You don't have that in, in, in many places uh, in India or in Africa and many other parts of the world. So if they are going to start developing the same way you all did in this part of the world, you're going to end up with far more global warming, not less. So I think there is a moral responsibility not for colonial reasons, but for environmental reasons for all these countries to actually seriously share with the developing world the green technologies they develop so these countries can develop but without causing the kind of damage to the environment that the developed countries have already caused. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Thurber, for your speech and your time. Um, I am from the Sadly, you know, I'm not a professor, but I'll, I'll, I'll accept the distinction for now. Thank you. <laughs> Honorary... At LSE, thank you. Uh, I'm from the Economic History Department at LSE, and there are several professors, um, who uh, academics who have worked here, such as I don't know whether you know Patrick O'Brien, um, who would argue the opposite. They've argued that uh, if you do proper accounting, that actually the colonial empire of Britain was a loss to uh, Britain, and actually the British government in India was only 10% um, uh, of of uh, of public spending within uh, the region. Um, what would be your response to uh, such I don't know his specific work, but the similar arguments I've seen from elsewhere are, are, are actually completely, uh, forgive me, um, ill thought through because what they take, for example, would be the expenditure by the British government in India as the government of India as British expenditure, whereas in fact they're all raised from Indian taxes. Throughout the 19th century and for much of the 20th, India generated surpluses for Britain. So even though this was money spent by the British government in India, in India, it was money raised from Indian taxpayers, very often from, from peasants who couldn't afford uh, uh, millions of the lifestyle that their taxes were paying an imperial civil servant to enjoy. So I, I'd love to know how these calculations are done. You know, what are you calculating in the accounting ledger? Uh, but uh, uh, neither the argument that it was a loss nor the argument that it was a wash. That's the other argument I've heard that, you know, yes, Britain took a lot, but it also spent a lot, therefore it's quits. They don't add up. And, and you know, uh, I, I really would like to know what they're counting and, and what they're counting as whose money. Because a lot of the money the British spent in their own name was actually taken from India to be spent. Hi. Um, given the passionate way or the impassionate way in which you've talked about your book just now, I was singularly struck by the two different titles that the same book has in two <laughs> different markets. And, um, you know, to call something an era of darkness, which appeals immediately to a certain audience in India, is very different from a use like Inglorious Empire, which, however generous I may be, is very Jane Austen. <laughs> um, well, let me, let me stress that um, my title was An Era of Darkness. Uh, the British publisher didn't like it, and every publisher has a good sense of what will prevail in their markets, what their readers and audience would appreciate. Inglorious Empire wouldn't have worked in India because in India there is no association of empire with glory. We've never thought of it as glorious, and therefore inglorious doesn't have any shock value, whereas in Britain it does. I mean, as you know, the word inglorious has only been associated in recent public imagination with a movie title, and the second word that follows it is, is, is something that perhaps Indians occasionally apply to the Brits, but, um, <laughs> but it's not empire. 
So um, when it was suggested to me, I said, yeah, that, that, that's fine, that works, keeping in mind the British audience. Um, but certainly an era of darkness um, uh, was what I came up with, both because darkness is a colonial trope used about the colonized. I mean, Conrad's heart of darkness, where is the darkness? Of course, I'm sure literature professors will tell you it's also the darkness in man's soul and in the heart of society and so on, but it's also the darkness of the dark continent that he's talking about. Well, the counter-argument is you brought us the darkness. We were bright and sunny. In fact, look outside at your climate and you know the darkness comes from here. <laughs> uh, we, we have sunshine. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, so that's, that's the answer. Uh, let's take another five, ten minutes max. Okay, brilliant. Okay, five, so, seven so minutes. So we maybe. go up till eight, okay? Okay, let's go. Um, this lady here and this uh, red t shirt at the back who's been waiting very patiently. Yeah, go ahead, quickly and short, please. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Tharoor and uh, Banerjee, for a very insightful discussion. My name is Dr. Priya Vimani, and my question today is about foreign aid. The topic of foreign aid is becoming an increasingly contentious issue here in the UK. I would love to know your view on British foreign aid to India and how you would like to see this going forward develop. We don't need it. I mean, very simply, I don't think that the British should be giving any aid to the government of India, and whatever aid they're giving to the government should probably stop. However, if Britain, either through its official institutions or through non-governmental charities, wishes to directly aid poor people, who historically obviously have found poverty thanks to British colonialism, uh, it would not be a bad thing and they could continue doing that. But I don't think the government of India should accept a penny from the government of Britain. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Thank go. You very much. Uh, I don't have been taught anything about the Akbar at school. But what I would like to ask is what, if anything, in your view, can Britain be proud of? <laughs> well, I'd probably say the invention of cricket. Which, uh, which has been described by an Indian sociologist as an Indian game accidentally discovered by the British. <laughs> no, but I, I know that sounds facetious. And in fact, in the book, I, I talk about the fact that, you know, I wish I could credit the British for three things we greatly value today, the English language, cricket, and tea. Speaking very personally, all three are amongst my addictions. Uh, but not one of them was actually brought into India to benefit my kind. They were not brought in for the benefit of Indians. The English language, there was no intention on the part of the British to actually educate the Indian masses. They made it very clear that all they wanted was to create a small governing, small in class of interpreters to be a buffer between them and the masses they governed. Uh, and in fact, um, they said essentially that they were not going to spend the money it would take to educate such a large number of people. Will Durant, the American historian, noticed that as late as 1930, the entire expenditure on education in the whole of India, in, under the British, from the lowest levels to the highest university, totally amounted to less than half the high school budget of the state of New York. So there was simply no serious commitment to educating India. So the fact that Indians took this language and made something of it for themselves made it, in fact, an instrument of Indian nationalism is to the credit of the Indians. Same with tea. It was brought by the British for themselves because they were spending too much buying it in China and shipping it to Britain. So they tried to grow it in India. They did succeed. There had been no organized cultivation of tea before the Brits. Full credit to them. But... They didn't in, were not interested in Indians drinking tea. They were shipping it to England. And a small amount for a, <coughs> a modest number of Englishmen in India. It was only with the Great Depression, when they were suddenly struck with vast quantities of unsold tea because the bottom dropped out of the market in England, that they then were forced to find an Indian client base and sell tea in India. And now, of course, it's become the Indian national drink. And as for cricket, another story. We'll talk about it over a drink one day. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thiru, for your talk. My name is uh, Samar Rizvi. I'm a final year history student in the, at LSE. So in the spirit of Vidi Brandt, Justin Trudeau, and Gandhian atonement, will you be asking Jyotiraditya Sindhya, current titular Maharaja of the 21 Guns Gwalior State and senior leader of your own Congress party, to apologize for, to the Indian people? For what, sorry? Would you be asking Jyotir? I'd be happy to ask him to apologize, but for what? No, Tell for this, if in, this, in the spirit of Gandhian atonement, just as you would ask Theresa May to apologize. 
No, but uh, I didn't quite get what you wanted him to apologize for. What, what did Sindhu do? Was he not essentially this co collaborator with the British authorities? His, his oh, I see what you mean. Yes. Collaboration. Well, I'm afraid there'd be far too many people in that case who had to apologize. <laughs> because, uh, because sadly, as you know, uh, not only were all the princes complicit, but there, was, um, there were an awful lot of Indians uh, who fell into the category that the scholars call the native informants. Uh, and, and Marxists would call the Comprador capitalists and all the others who sort of profited personally from uh, the British Empire. In fact, uh, yesterday at an event at which the Indian High Commissioner uh, unveiled the book and launched it, uh, he was saying how his own uh, grandfather and great-grandfather had been um, given titles and decorations by the British Empire. And, and you know, um, I don't think he particularly expressed any contrition about it. It was just a fact of the past. Uh, and I think... To some degree, we start going around tapping every Indian who is indirectly descended from somebody benefit from the Raj, we'd end up with an awful lot of Indians. So uh, that complicity is something I acknowledge in the book. It doesn't excuse the British for what they did. But sure, there were lots and lots of collaborators, not just in India, but in every colonial empire. Yeah. Uh, Hello, good sir. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, good evening, Dr. Thuru. Sorry, where is the question? Yeah, the lady here. Okay, hi. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. After listening to your talk, it's I'm not hearing you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you tilt the mic towards your mouth, perhaps? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so after listening to your talk, it's really clear that you're extremely passionate about the topic. So I'm just curious what inspired or rather provoked you to study, write, and talk about it like in cities like London, like the capital of the United Kingdom, where you might offend some extremists? Well, you know, I was always a history nut. I was a history nut right from my high school days. Um, uh, not only did I study history passion, but I was a kind of kid you would have all found me insufferable because I actually read beyond the school syllabus and I wrote essays for my own pleasure that the teachers had not asked for. <laughs> Just right now, somebody found a notebook of mine from when I was 14 years old in class 10 at St. Xavier's Calcutta full of essays that had never been submitted to a teacher because they had not been required to, but that I just wrote for myself because I found Indian history so fascinating. So it's just been with me throughout. And, um, and though obviously I had to do a lot of new and contemporary research for the current book, it's a passion that goes back to my childhood. There's a lovely true story that, ha that I actually witnessed uh, in Singapore when I was there as a young man, a, a Chinese brushwork artist did a demonstration of a Chinese brushwork painting and he unrolled the scroll and he picked out his brush and he did this beautiful sort of stuff and at the end of three minutes he showed the scroll to all of us and said $25,000. And the lady was utterly shocked and said, $25,000 for three minutes? And he looked at her very pained and said, three minutes, madam, and 35 years. <laughs> so this book, yes, was prompted by the Oxford speech but it, it really involves 45 years of thought, reflection, and passionate engagement with the issues that have today found place in this book. So that behind you, the red jumper. <clears throat> no, just here. Um, my question is uh, related to your argument on apology. I belong to Orissa, which is S12 Kalinga, which fought one of the bloodiest war with Magadha which was just current Bihar and the rest of, you know, that part of India. So uh, when Britishers left, also we had 500 to 700 princely states in our own country fighting with each other. So who would apologize, apologize whom? I mean, how, where the cycle would end? I think this, you know, argument of apology, I, I do agree there should be correctness of history, but this argument of apology, I think, is flawed. I think only because there is a direct and traceable benefit. I mean, in fact, this argument was used by, when I made my Oxford speech by a British historian, a very well-known one, who said, you know, why should we apologize? Uh, if we carry on like this, we'll be demanding an apology from the government of Italy for feeding the Christians to the lions. Uh, and I think that's frankly clever and witty, but absurd. Um, the British Empire is still, as we said at the very beginning of this discussion, very much present in the lives of the people around today. The British government, state, and people today see the consequences of empire around them, and certainly we live with the consequences of empire in our own society today, not to mention the fact that there are um, 
about 6 million people alive in India who were alive in 1947. And if you take their descendants in, maybe 100 million who've actually uh, heard from their parents and grandparents the stories uh, of the Raj. And all of that cumulatively, therefore, makes it still a living issue. Um, I would agree with you that one day it'll become too late. Perhaps by uh, 2119, there'll be no one around who actually cares for an apology for Jalem Bagh. In 2019, it's not too late. Okay. I'm sorry, there are going to be a lot of disappointed people, but I'm just about to take the last question. Hi, um, I was just wondering, going back to the title, um, why did you decide to say what the British did to India rather than the Indian subcontinent? Ah, because it was called India. I mean, what is today India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, etc., was called India. In fact, up to 1935, even Burma was part of India. It was the Indian Empire. The jewel in the crown was all of this. So, I mean, I, you know, it was simpler to say that. In fact, in the preface I mentioned, that pretty much all I say is equally applicable, at least to Pakistan and Bangladesh. And uh, it's up to them whether they want to sort of share in, 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 my, in my rage about it. Um, uh, certainly, uh, the whole history of Pakistan uh, would not exist without the British. Divide and rule and the consequences of it that led to partition uh, are directly traceable to British policy and British interventions time after time again. Um, so when I say India, I'm really using the term India as the British did. It applies to all of us. <laughs> Too late. Well, I mean, do you want it's to eight o'clock, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You, I mean, I have a responsibility to letting you go. Yes, if I'm going to sign any books, I'd better start doing it now. So come up with a book and I'll answer. Um, yeah, you, you can announce it. I, I'll have to leave by 8.15 because, unfortunately, I have a dinner engagement outside that I can't be any later for than that. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, if I could just make time. one announcement, if I could ask all of you to wait for just a couple of minutes... For those of you who would like to get a copy of the book signed by Ms. Dr. Tharoor, the books, when you go out, are being sold to your right. The signing is happening in the completely opposite direction. There's a table between the Wolfson and Tide Theatres. There's a red-colored table with a tablecloth, which matches Shashi's shirt. <laughs> so he's going to sit there and sign. So you buy the book, and you make your way backwards, and you'll see him sitting there. Thank you. Can we all just thank him for the thing?